Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. So that requires a response. Let's try that again. Hello, everybody. All right. We are alive. Okay, good. Well, welcome to the Vernon M. and Minnie I. Lynch Lecture. My name is Mercedes. Um, some of you know me, some of you don't. I'm the executive assistant to the dean, or as he says, his left and his right hand. <laughs> <laughs> and it is um, a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. We're so glad that you penciled us into your schedule. Um, tonight, you're really in for a treat. Uh, we want to thank Medea uh, for being with us tonight, for agreeing to come and spend some time with us. Um, I just want to give you just a few quick things, because I know we've been away from each other for a while, so we may have forgotten. But I am your trusty um, HOA <laughs> neighbor, right? So we just want to remind you that there is no food or drink in the auditorium. So you might want to finish that glass really quickly. And also, um, we're going to ask you to silence your phone. So if you have your phone, go ahead and take it out. You can take a selfie before you do if you want to. We welcome it. Um, but we're going to ask you to silence your phone so there's no interruptions. And also, um, we're going to be recording this tonight. So we're going to ask you not to record or to take any photos during the lecture. OK, is that good? Yes? OK, perfect. Thank you so much. So we're going to get ready uh, to start. And the last thing I want to say is that uh, Medea is going to be signing some books during the reception following this event. So feel free to stop by the bookstore table right out in the art gallery. They are on sale. And you're welcome to purchase one. And she will be happy to sign them for you. OK. All right. So take a deep breath. Let it out gently. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get ready to get started. So it is my pleasure. So if you could just join me in welcoming our dean, uh, Dean Alp Osederm. Right. Good evening, everyone. Our colleagues, friends, wonderful students, and ladies and gentlemen. Good evening and welcome to the Carter School Lynch Lecture 2022. I'm Alper Zerdem, Dean of the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter School for Peace and Conflict Resolution. And it's a great honor to welcome you all this evening. And I'm thrilled to welcome Media Benjamin, our distinguished speaker for this year's Lynch Lecture. Media, it's a real great honor to have you as our uh, speaker. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you once again for your continued support to the Carter School as a member of the Dean's Council. Now, the last time when we were in this auditorium, that was back in 2019. And at the time, I was a new Dean. Right, I was using that title quite a bit. <laughs> And as an excuse for a while, you know, when people ask me, like, you know, something, I say, I'm a new dean, you know. <laughs> but the life has changed, right, since then. So much happened. And really, to be here in this room for this lecture in person is just, it feels so wonderful. I mean, I, in fact, in the height of that pandemic, I thought that I would ever, never see this again. Right, having you in the auditorium for this uh, lecture. So really, it's so wonderful to see you. And on behalf of uh, George Mason University and my faculty and staff at Carter School, I thank you for being part of our Carter School community. So you may know that this year, George Mason University turned 50. And what a fantastic milestone that is. But mind you, George Mason is still younger than me. <laughs> George Mason is a young university, but has quite an impressive resume. From its origins as a branch campus of the University of Virginia, to its current status of Virginia's largest and most diverse. George Mason has experienced 50 years of great growth and achievement. 
Now, that's something to be proud of. And in those 50 years, the Carter School has been a part of Mason for more than 40 years and has a significant impact on its success. We started our journey as a small center with a handful of faculty, and there are some people in this auditorium still remember those days. And then we became a institute and a school, and today we are the Carter School. And that's something that we are so proud of. Thank you. And 40 years, we sent generations of peace builders from different backgrounds at every degree level, undergraduate, masters, PhD, out into the world to promote and achieve peace in any way they can. Today, we have over 2,000 alumni creating waves of impact in peace and conflict resolution worldwide. For 40 years, the Carter School has been the leader in the field of peace and conflict resolution, impacting communities across the globe. So for example, I just come back from the South Kivu region of the Democratic Republic of Congo. I was there last week, where we are facilitating a local-led peacemaking process with our local partners. So that's a really unique achievement. Not many academic institutions do that. And we have over 80 armed groups in this process. And it was just so inspirational to see that, to start with, the peace process has been holding after 11 months. And secondly, whoever we spoke, the local authorities, civil society organizations, the representatives of armed groups, ex-combatants, they were telling us that we do a great job with our local-led peacemaking there in South Kivu. And I think we should, as the Carter School community, congratulate ourselves for being brave in undertaking peace processes like this. And we have the energy, we have the uh, acumen, we have the expertise, and I think we should do more of this. And we are really in a unique place. And since the Russian invasion of Ukraine started eight months ago, the Carter School has been generating different initiatives to enable political settlement opportunities and plan for the country's post-war reconstruction. We are also in the South Caucasus. We are in Afghanistan. We are in Syria. And we are in many parts of the world torn apart by armed conflict. And here at home too, our faculty and students have, also, have always been actively engaged in a wide range of conflict resolution, uh, conflict prevention, social justice, and reconciliation challenges for decades. So when we talk about practice and having an impact, we really mean it and we make it happen. So this is not just a slogan for the Carter School. This is a reality for us. So overall, the Carter School is an exceptional place. And I'm not just saying that because I'm the dean. But I think it's true. This is at least what we are told by our students, our alumni, by our partners, and the peace community at large. So with that in mind, I should also point out that we have many unique qualities, but one quality particularly matters to us. We recognize that peacemaking is a controversial occupation. And our school is dedicated to letting a diverse variety of voices be heard throughout its 40-year history. For example, like many, many other armed conflicts, there are many different views of the war in Ukraine. And what to do about it? And even among our very own community. Having open discussions of these matters is an essential part of our mission. Therefore, I particularly welcome this evening's lecture for allowing us to have constructive discussions on such critical issue and challenge. Right.
I think I should now wrap up my remarks and leave you with this evening's keynote, which I'm sure will be such a treat for all of us. However, before that, I'd like to acknowledge several people. So to start with, every aspect of tonight's event was planned with great care by a small team of exceptional staff. I want to thank Mercedes Azop. You saw her earlier. She's been busy with this organization for months. And, 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 and I think her dedication for each detail is just so impressive. And tonight, we are also supported by Carter School student ambassadors. I think they're here. Can they stand up, actually? Are they here, <laughs> ambassadors? Our students are, they are our pride and joy. And, and I must say, every time I speak to our students, I'm just so impressed, not with only uh, their knowledge, but also for their passion for peace and for their passion to make a change in the world. And I think that makes us so different in many ways. So thank you guys, you've done a great job. And also, uh, the faculty, staff, and students of Carter School are enormously grateful to the Lynch family for their friendship, dedication, and support to us over the years. They've been so generous with us through their gifts, which include an endowed chair, our beautiful international training and retreat center point of view, and support for the practice of conflict resolution. The Lynch family has been pivotal in many ways for making a real difference at the Carter School. I also want to thank all members of our advisory board and Dean's Council for their never lasting generosity and support. Several of them are here with us tonight. And it's because of them, like the Lynch family, that we are able to realize our dreams at the Carter School. I call them dream makers. Amongst you also, we have so many of our students and alumni. They are both our dreams and wonderful achievements. They are our change makers. They are our agents of transformation for more peaceful and just societies across the world. Finally, I'd like to thank my dear colleague, Dr. Susan Hirsch, the Vernon Min uh, Mini Lynch Chair here at the Carter School for organizing this annual lecture with so much incredible dedication and care. This is an annual thing, and Susan works on it so much and really comes up with great results each year. I don't know how she manages that, but she does. And that is just such a significant contribution to our school. Susan, thank you very much. And now, seriously, I'm concluding. Uh, but before that, I just want to introduce <laughs> Dr. Susan Hirsch. Uh, Dr. Hirsch is a professor of conflict resolution and anthropology. Her scholarship focuses on love in relation to conflict, international and transitional justice, environmental justice, feminist approaches to love and conflict, and legal responses to terrorism. She is the author of numerous highly acclaimed academic publications. And currently, she leads the Transitioning Justice Peace Lab at the Carter School. And I must say that her recent work with Restorative Arlington process has been phenomenal. So with that, Susan, over to you. Thank you. It is really wonderful to be back in this setting with, uh, with everyone. It's been since 2019. It's so great to see, especially the faces of students who I've only known over Zoom. It's just wonderful to be in your presence uh, and to see, of course, uh, colleagues. 
thank you, Al, um, and to everyone for coming out uh, tonight. I have, I'll try to make my remarks brief because I know we're eager to, to hear from our speaker, and I'll introduce her in just a second. So this is the beginning of my second five-year term as Lynch Chair, and it's really been an honor to hold the Lynch Chair and let me add my gratitude to the Lynch family for their generosity to the Carter School. I want to recognize my colleague, uh, Sandy Sheldon, who was the first Lynch Chair and provided such an incredible model uh, for me. I also want to thank my husband, Michael Sullivan, who's here. Uh, with me tonight and supports me in, in all of this work. And then let me just finish with the thank yous. Um, many people have been mentioned already. This wouldn't happen without Mercedes Alsup and all the work that she puts into it. And I'm grateful uh, to work with her. I'm happy um, to have the ambassadors here and volunteers from the Transitioning Justice Peace Lab uh, University Life, Arlington Events, GMU TV, the bookstore, uh, everyone, thank you so much. As Lynch Chair, my activities have been focused on the theme of justice. And under that theme, I've been really thrilled to co-establish with Patricia Malden the Transitioning Justice Peace Lab. We have a little table display out there, so please take a look. Uh, the lab hosts uh, some major initiatives on restorative justice and on education in carceral societies. And stay tuned, we're gonna have a lot more happening in those areas over the next couple of, couple of years. Uh, my view and the view of the lab has been that we champion justice as a guiding value and one that's inextricable from our pursuit of peace. So peace. Tonight's speaker, Medea Benjamin, has centered her work on peace. I couldn't be more pleased to have Medea here tonight to deliver the 2022 Lynch Lecture. She's a foundational figure in the movement for peace in the United States and is well known internationally. With colleagues, she established Code Pink, an extraordinary group of activists and strategists whose aims range from policy analysis and political action to women-to-women -women models of peace building, to a menu of direct actions for peace that includes street theater and civil disobedience. Code Pink and Medea show up loud, colorful, and creative to raise awareness and promote solidarity. Medea's efforts should appeal to our students, many of whom have been involved in direct actions around Black Lives Matter, me Too, the March for Our Lives, and calls for peace in so many heartbreaking conflicts, including the war in Ukraine. One hallmark of Medea's approach is to bring women together with other women to work for peace. And if you'll permit me a personal story here. In late 2001, I was invited by Medea's group to join one of those efforts. After 9-11 and the US invasion of Afghanistan, Medea organized a delegation of people like myself who had lost family to Al Qaeda attacks in the US and elsewhere. The plan was to travel to Afghanistan to meet with Afghan people who themselves had lost loved ones through US military action. Long story short, for me, PTSD and fears about personal safety meant that I felt I could not join Medea's delegation. Thinking back, I have a strong sense that my life might have been very different had I done so. Then and now, I endorse efforts to forge solidarity between people who others assume would be sworn enemies. This ethic recognizes common humanity in our suffering. We have interdependency with others, and we should recognize the obligations that that interdependency puts before us. And one of those obligations is to pursue peace. I recently came across a quote from a press conference that Medea gave when that 2002 delegation returned from Afghanistan. I wanna quote her because the sentiment 
It reflects the post 9-11 time, but it remains very relevant for us today. So quote, if we are indeed in a war against terrorism, then isn't part of that war to recognize the humanity of all people and to recognize that the loss of innocent lives in Afghanistan is every bit as tragic as the loss of lives of our own families and our own people. If we don't make that clear, however are we going to feel safe? And however are we going to build the real foundation of peace? End quote. And for me, this quote just really uh, gets at the kinds of things that I hope we're doing here at the Carter School. Calling out injustice, demanding accountability, and exposing corrupt and deadly backstories of military expansion. These have figured repeatedly in Medea's work. She's offered insightful analysis of the most intractable conflicts of our time. And just a couple of her book titles from her 10 uh, books give us that sense. Drone Warfare, Killing by Remote Control. Kingdom of the Unjust, Behind the US-Saudi Connection. And Inside Iran, The Real History and Politics of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Medea has changed many lives in her unrelenting quest to end war and to champion a movement for peace. Would that more of us could have such clarity in our mission in this world? I'm really grateful for your work, Medea, and I join the many who are inspired by it. The title of Medea's talk tonight is the title of her new book, available outside at a discount. And that is War in Ukraine, Making Sense of a Senseless Conflict. Please join me in welcoming Medea Benjamin to the podium. Well, it's such an honor to be here. I want to thank the dean. I want to thank Mercedes and Susan. That was an incredible introduction. Uh, and it's a real honor to be here. I, whenever I hear somebody say, like, I've been doing this work for 50 years, I think, gosh, I'm old. But also, it's 54 years, because I started when I was in high school, and the Vietnam War was raging. My sister was two years older, and her boyfriend was sent off to Vietnam. We had a draft in those days. And he was a wonderful young man, and he started writing letters. And every month, the letters got weirder and weirder. And I was wondering, what's happening to him? And about six months after he was sent to fight in Vietnam, he sent home a gift to my sister, which was a package. And she opened it all excited. And it was the ear of a Viet Cong with a string around it to wear around her neck. And that was my aha moment when I knew something is wrong with war and sending young people, men or women, across to places they know nothing about, or issues they know nothing about, to kill other people. And I have, in my gut, a real hatred of war and a real sense that we as a civilization have to evolve, and we're not evolving. And to say that I'm a leader in the anti-war movement makes me feel terrible, because we have such a terrible anti-war movement. <laughs> we're not able to stop wars. They just keep happening. We get out of one, and we're into another. And um, it's just this vicious cycle. And you know, sometimes people ask me, well, is it the military, industrial, congressional, security, academia, complex, you know, is that? And, you know, I don't know. At some point, I think, you know, maybe there are these really deep state uh, powers that keep us in these wars that benefit just a handful of companies, but somehow they benefit lots of people who make their living in one way or another off of conflicts. And it's, um, it's very depressing. Sometimes you think that you've done something really good, like during the Obama years, when uh, we were very involved in pushing for the nuclear agreement with Iran. 
and thought, wow, we have avoided a war. This is really great. And then Trump came in and withdrew the US from that agreement. And another example under Obama was the normalization of relations with Cuba, which I thought was just so important because we've had such a horrific relationship with so many of our Latin and American neighbors, the Monroe Doctrine, which next year is gonna be 200 years of the US saying we have a right in our part of the world to say what goes on there. Um, and so Cuba is so symbolic of so many things. And it was very exciting during the Obama years to see the melting away of a lot of the restrictions that kept us from communicating with our Cuban neighbors, uh, seeing the normalization of relations, seeing the uh, what were called intersections converted into embassies, having a real Cuban embassy here in Washington was thrilling. And it was also thrilling to go to Cuba and see how the flood of US tourists going there really impacted the society. It created all kinds of private enterprise that didn't exist before. It was a win-win situation. And when Obama went to Cuba, he was just the most loved person. Oh my goodness, it was amazing. And um, then Trump came and all of that was gone as well. Now, it doesn't mean that we can just say, okay, you know, well, we lost that one. It means that it's a never ending process <laughs> and that you keep have to work and work and work. And even when you think you've achieved something, um, you don't know how long that's gonna last. But, um, you know, now we're confronted with a different kind of conflict because I've been so used to conflicts where the US has been the aggressor and it's trying to stop my government's aggression. And now it's the Russians who came in with their tanks and attacked another sovereign country. And so how do we wrap our heads around that and what is our responsibility? So that's why I wrote this book. Uh, I was also saying that I, all, I have family that comes from Ukraine and family that comes from Russia and so it's personal as well. The book is summarized in this video that we're gonna show you. It's a 20 minute video and it gives kind of an overview of uh, how I and my co-author uh, Nicholas Davis uh, analyzed this, this uh, complex issue. And then I'll give more of a talk to bring us up to date on the um, US political scene vis-a-vis -vis this conflict. And then I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your disagreements. Thank you so much. Let's talk about the heartbreaking war in Ukraine and what we could do to try to end it. Every day the war rages on, civilians and soldiers are being killed. Millions of Ukrainians have been forced to flee and seek asylum in foreign lands. Schools, Hospitals, apartment buildings, and infrastructure have been reduced to rubble. We wrote this book to try to help people make sense of a war that should never have happened, a war that has raged on for months and might well rage on for years, a war that could lead to a nuclear confrontation, a war that must be stopped. We know that people have very different opinions about this conflict, and we hope that our book and this talk will foster respectful dialogue. We have not tried to justify or excuse Russia's invasion of Ukraine because we do not think it is justifiable or excusable. We hope we can help you understand the context, the background, and the actions of all the parties that led to this crisis. As U.S. citizens, we have very little hope of influencing the Russian government, but we should be able to influence our own government, which is why it's so important to look at the role the United States has played in fomenting the conflict. Let's look at two elements of U.S. involvement that we highlight in our book, NATO expansion and the events of 2014. Western leaders call NATO a defensive military alliance but NATO was formed to defend Western Europe from invasion by the Soviet Union. That mission was accomplished when the Soviet Union disintegrated 
in 1991. NATO should have been dissolved at the end of the Cold War, along with the Warsaw Pact, which was NATO's counterpart in the Eastern Bloc. Instead, NATO reinvented itself to justify its continued existence. It expanded all the way to Russia's borders, despite many promises that it would not do so, and ignoring warnings from experienced U.S. and Western diplomats that this would lead to a predictable yet entirely avoidable crisis with Russia, has, as in fact it has. You can see the map showing the various waves of expansion in which NATO incorporated former Soviet republics and Russia's European neighbors. In 2018, the antagonism reached new heights when NATO, under U.S. pressure, publicly promised membership to the former Soviet republics of Ukraine and Georgia. While no definite date was set, NATO began supplying increased levels of military aid and training to Ukraine, including Ukraine in military exercises. So Russia certainly had legitimate concerns about Ukraine's involvement in an ever-expanding military alliance that was encircling Russia with powerful military forces and had already unleashed aggressive wars and occupations in Kosovo in 1999, Afghanistan in 2001, and Libya and Syria in 2011. The other event that served to set the stage for the Russian invasion in 2022 was the coup in Ukraine in 2014. The 2014 upheavals began with massive peaceful protests against the corrupt pro-Russian president Viktor Yanukovych. Unfortunately, though, these protests turned violent and were co-opted by neo-Nazi groups that refused to go along with an internationally negotiated plan for a political transition, and instead, they spearheaded a coup. The extent of U.S. support and involvement in this coup is still shrouded in secrecy, as are previous U.S.-backed coups in Iran, Chile, and many other countries. But a leaked audio tape of Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland and U.S. Ambassador Jeffrey Pyatt exposed their roles as coup managers as they handpicked what positions each of their Ukrainian collaborators would assume in the post-coup government. Although the original peaceful protests in Ukraine were about wanting to join the European Union, Newland dismissed the European Union's more popular choice for Prime Minister, Vitaly Klitschko, with her infamous F the EU remark. According to a Gallup poll conducted in April 2014, nearly 50% of Ukrainians rejected the legitimacy of the post-coup government. This led to rebellions in parts of Ukraine that were ethnically and culturally close to Russia. In Crimea, a peninsula on the Black Sea with a mostly Russian-speaking population that was part of Russia from 1783 until 1954, as well as in the eastern provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk. In Odessa, 42 anti-coup protesters were burned to death by a mob on May 2, 2014. The new government in Ukraine was rejected by the parliament in Crimea, and a referendum to rejoin Russia passed overwhelmingly and was accepted by Russia but not recognized by other countries. The provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk also passed referendums declaring themselves independent from Ukraine, leading to a civil war that killed an estimated 14,000 people. Many Ukrainian military units based in this region defected to the self-declared People's Republics, or refused to fight their own people. So the Ukrainian government formed new National Guard units to fight the separatists. These included units like the Asov Battalion, recruited from the same neo-Nazi groups that took up arms to spearhead the coup in Kiev in February 2014. 
The worst fighting of the Civil War ended in February 2015 with the signing of the Minsk II Accord. This was drafted by France, Germany, and Russia, and agreed to by Ukraine and the self-declared republics. It set up a ceasefire and a buffer zone between the warring parties and was monitored by 1,300 monitors and staff from the OSCE, which is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. While the ceasefire largely held from 2015 to 2022, the Ukrainian government failed to implement the political aspects of the Minsk II agreement. It had agreed to grant Donetsk and Luhansk a new autonomous status, but each time the Ukrainian government tried to move forward on this, extreme right-wing forces re-exerted their power and insisted that Ukraine must instead keep fighting to recover its lost territories. NATO and the U.S. also bear responsibility for the failure of Minsk II. Despite officially claiming to support the agreement, NATO and the U.S., under both Trump and Biden, kept building up Ukraine's military, encouraging the Ukrainian government to believe it could eventually recover Donbass and Crimea by force, and that the U.S. and NATO would support that. As tensions were reaching a boiling point in December 2021, Russia took the initiative of drafting two mutual security treaties, one between Russia and the United States and the other between Russia and NATO. These were not take-it-or-leave-it demands, but drafts for negotiation. Unfortunately, the United States and NATO summarily dismissed Russia's proposals. By building up Ukraine's military, promising Ukraine-NATO membership, and dismissing negotiations, the U.S. and its allies turn Ukraine into a dangerous weapon in their revived Cold War against Russia. Then, in the days leading up to February's Russia invasion, the OSCE ceasefire monitors documented thousands of explosions around the ceasefire line in Donbass, mostly on the Donetsk and Luhansk side, indicating a major escalation of artillery fire by Ukrainian government forces. So even in the immediate causes of the war, it is deceptive to describe the invasion as unprovoked, as Biden and U.S. officials routinely do. By early 2022, Russia had amassed large military forces near Belarus's border and its own borders with Ukraine all the while denying that it had plans to invade. It also formally recognized Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics as independent countries. On February 24th, Russia invaded. The invasion was illegal on many counts. It was not an act of self-defense, and it certainly was not authorized by the United Nations. Under international law, including the Kellogg-Briand Pact and the UN Charter, the invasion was an illegal crime of aggression. Russia did not just move its invading forces into Donbass to support the breakaway republics, but it launched offensive towards the capital, Kyiv, and the second largest city, Kharkiv, in the northeast, and into the southern part of Ukraine from Crimea. Western analysts generally agree that Russia must have hoped to take quickly Kyiv and install a friendly government, but it encountered strong resistance from Ukrainian forces and was forced to withdraw from the north. Ukraine's western neighbors responded to the invasion by granting asylum to millions of refugees, while the U.S. and other NATO countries poured billions of dollars worth of weapons into Ukraine, stepped up their training of Ukrainian military, and provided it with intelligence to accurately attack important Russian targets. There has been little or no accountability for the weapons flooding into Ukraine. There are reports that as little as 30 percent of them may be reaching the front lines because they are either destroyed by Russian missiles or siphoned off into the black market where they could end up in the hands of the Islamic State, neo-Nazis, or other dangerous groups around the world. This was precisely why the U.S. Congress prohibited the transfer of U.S. weapons 
to the Asov Regiment in 2018 as it became a magnet and a hub for international right-wing militant networks. Yet after the Russian invasion, all restraints were lifted and thousands of tons of powerful and advanced weapons have poured in over the Polish border. There was so little debate about this in the U.S. that when Congress passed an enormous $40 billion package for Ukraine, with most of the money to be spent on more and more lethal weapons for up to another decade, not a single Democrat voted against it. Not even Congresswoman Barbara Lee, who cast the lone, wise, and prophetic vote against the disastrous war in Afghanistan in 2001. In our book, we explain the peace negotiations in Turkey in March that could have already ended this war, and the largely unreported role of the U.S. and British governments in killing those talks. The talks during the first month of the war produced the contours of a 15-point peace plan for a ceasefire, a Russia withdrawal, and a future for Ukraine as an independent, peaceful, and neutral country. On March 27th, President Zelensky told a national TV audience, Our goal is obvious, peace and the restoration of normal life in our native state as soon as possible. Under the draft agreement, Ukraine would neither be a military ally of the United States and NATO, nor of Russia, with no foreign military bases or installations on its territory. Ukraine would get security guarantees from other countries. Russian speakers in Ukraine would be free to speak, read, and study in Russian. And the future of Crimea and Donbass would be determined by an internationally accepted political process during a transition period of several years. But none of that came to pass. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson went to Kyiv on April 9th and told Prime Minister Zelensky that the UK would not be party to any agreement between Ukraine and Russia, and that the collective West, as he called it, saw a chance to press Russia and was determined to make the most of it. Turkish diplomats who had been mediating the ceasefire talks reported that U.S. Defense Secretary Austin delivered a similar message to Zelensky, and that these messages effectively killed their peace efforts. So early hopes for a negotiated peace were dashed, largely as a result of U.S. and British determination to weaken Russia, even at the cost of rivers of Ukrainian blood, in an open-ended war that could last for years. The undermining of ceasefire talks was a tragic lost opportunity. Since the talks were abandoned, the slaughter and destruction has continued with hundreds of Ukrainians killed every day. Russia has taken control of more territory and despite the successful Ukrainian counteroffensive, Russia now occupies 20% of Ukraine. The sanctions against Russia have backfired leading to soaring energy prices worldwide, while reduced grain exports have led to widespread hunger, particularly in the global south. Europe is facing an energy and home heating crisis. Meanwhile, no sign has honestly or publicly explained what its goals are in this war, or why they can possibly justify the total destruction of Ukraine and even the greater danger of nuclear war. Even the old war hawk Henry Kissinger is warning that U.S. policy has blundered to the brink of a world war with no clear purpose or endgame in sight. He told the Wall Street Journal, We are at the edge of war with Russia and China on issues which we partly created without any concept of how this is going to end or what it's supposed to lead to. And here at home... We are told we don't have the funds for a decent health care system or free college education or housing for the unhoused. We cannot allow our public funds to be squandered on yet another unwinnable war and an even more all-consuming military budget. Governments in the global south are watching the impacts of this war plunge millions of their people into hunger and famine, 
while Europe's energy crisis is already sinking the continent into a recession. We in the U.S. have been relatively unscathed by this war compared to many people elsewhere. But we are already facing rising prices, which will get worse as the war continues. And the U.S. will not be exempt from the impacts of this looming global recession. With climate chaos jeopardizing the very future of life on this planet, this war is derailing our efforts to confront the climate crisis. Instead of a Green New Deal, we are now watching a mad scramble to produce more oil, gas, and coal as energy companies reap record profits from their disaster capitalism. And while the climate heats up and governments and corporations shift their already inadequate climate plans into reverse, Russia and the U.S. are threatening us with yet another existential disaster a nuclear apocalypse. We understand that some people may disagree with our analysis of this conflict, but hopefully we can all agree that we must do whatever we can to bring this war to an end. And that's why Code Pink is part of a coalition called Peace in Ukraine. We pressure our members of Congress and the White House to call for negotiations. We call on the media to promote the voice of peacemakers. We distribute our messages via social media, and we educate the public, including getting our book into libraries and classrooms. And we encourage you to join us. We must act now to say, stop the bloodshed, stop the bombing, stop the madness. We must work together to demand a ceasefire and negotiations, not more war. Thank you. So I just want to make some remarks before opening up to a discussion. And I want to start out with something that happened this week that I find particularly disturbing. How many of you heard reports about a letter that 30 members of Congress signed? Um, most of you have heard about this. Well, it created big news, and not for a very positive reason. <laughs> Um, this letter was initiated by the head of the Progressive Caucus in Congress, Pramila Jayapal. And it has been in the works for a long time. I'm part of a coalition that saw this letter in its various forms starting back in the summer. And I remember reading it and saying, oh my goodness, this is such a mild letter. It starts out praising President Biden for all he's done for the people of Ukraine. It talks about all the financial, military, economic aid that Congress has given to Ukraine. It says that uh, coupled with all of that support should be an effort at negotiations. That's all it said. It even said, and this should be in accordance with the desires of Ukraine. I mean, I ask you to go back and read the letter because it's important, especially for you students. It's important to read it. I thought it was the most mild manner letter, and I thought this is going to be no problem to get the whole Progressive Caucus, which is the largest caucus in Congress, it has 100 members, they'll all sign up and we'll probably get some other people who aren't in the Progressive Caucus. <laughs> and so we start at that point because they've been waiting so long to get this letter out, they finally said, okay, 30, round number, seems okay, we'll put this letter out. Well, first thing that happened is that there was a lovely article in the Washington Post that came out about it. And then all hell broke loose. It was amazing. It was as if they were traitors. They were trashed on the social media. They were vilified by members of their own party. And you can just imagine how the leadership in the Democratic Party must have come down on them like a ton of bricks. Because one by one, even the signers 
started making up excuses for why they signed this letter. Oh, I did it way back in the summer when things were different. Oh, I didn't know that it was going to come out sounding like that. Um, oh, uh, I didn't think it would come out right before the election. And that's one of the big things, is that the timing was bad. It came out a couple of weeks before an election. But the opposition was not just about the timing. And when I say one by one, people were balking. These are some of the most progressive members of Congress. It was people like Jamie Raskin, who wrote a long refutation that was just knocked me in the head. Uh, it was uh, Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs. Uh, it was the former co-chair of the Progressive Caucus, Mark Pocan. It was even Ilhan Omar that said, I wouldn't have signed that letter today. And one of the reasons they gave is because back then when we signed it, it looked like Ukraine was losing. And now it looks like Ukraine is winning. So we shouldn't negotiate now. And you know, you just got to scratch your head and say, what are these people, what, what are they thinking? What does winning mean? Because right now, winning means clawing back every inch of territory that Russia has taken. So that means all the Donbass, and it even means Crimea. And you talk to any rational uh, expert on this or military person, and they'll say, that's just not going to happen. And so what does winning mean at this point? And in fact, what we also know is that as the situation gets tougher and tougher for Russia, we are getting closer and closer to the possibility of a third world war or a nuclear war. And we see right now, this week, there are war exercises with nuclear war exercises going on by NATO with B-52 bombers flying over the Black Sea in a simulation of nuclear annihilation of Russia. We see Russia with new nuclear war exercises. I mean, this is scary times. And yet, what seems to be the scariest thing for the leadership in this country, in the White House, is a letter by 30 members of Congress calling for negotiations. What is so threatening about that? I find that very scary. I find it scary that members of Congress don't really have the right to free speech, free dialogue, free discussion, like I hope we all have here. I find it scary that diplomacy has been equated with being in Putin's pocket, with being a traitor to your country, with being a traitor to your party. I find that extremely scary for the future of US policymaking on this and other issues. And so we look at one of the other things that came up was you can't talk to Putin. Now, I heard this as I went around into different offices. And I even heard it from progressives like Bernie Sanders. You know, Bernie Sanders made a comment after the letter. Oh, I didn't even say the, the, the most important part is that 24 hours after the letter came out, they withdrew it. They withdrew a letter. I've never in all my time in Washington seen a letter that was signed, sealed, and delivered, and then withdrawn. So Bernie Sanders said he was glad that letter was withdrawn. And when I went to his office, naively thinking several months back that we should have a similar letter coming from the Senate and that his office would be a good place to go for that, his legislative people said to me, that letter is tone deaf. You cannot talk to Putin. So here we are at the Carter School. 
<laughs> Here we are with people who are studying conflict resolution, people who are involved in conflict resolution. I don't have to tell you that most wars end at the negotiating table. I don't have to tell you that you don't negotiate with your friends. You negotiate with your adversaries. You negotiate because you want to stop the killing. You negotiate because you want to find an alternative to war. And so this idea that you can't talk to Putin is something I find very curious. And there's really only way to test that, and that's by talking. There are also, as we said in the, in the video, there were examples of talks in the early stages of this war that took place in Turkey where it seemed like there might be an agreement that was reached. There was a 15-point plan. And yet, it does appear to be that the US and the UK changed the goalposts and said, well, this is not about stopping the war. This is about weakening Putin. Because that's precisely what Secretary of Defense Austin said, that we have to weaken Russia. And it's important to understand that there have been talks on particular issues and successful ones. For example, a lot of us didn't know that there was so much grain in Ukraine that was necessary for feeding countries around the world, especially North Africa and the Middle East. And when that grain wasn't getting out, it was a crisis. And so there were talks to create land corridors and sea corridors to get that grain out. And a lot of that grain has been getting out. There have also been talks when people were horrified about the shelling at the largest nuclear plant in Europe, the Zaporizhia nuclear plant, and each side accusing the other of shelling that plant and people just imagining what could happen if that plant really blew up. And so there were talks to get representatives from the International Atomic Energy Agency into that plant. There have also been talks about prisoner swaps. And there have been many prisoner swaps. We don't tend to hear about them in the United States. But I've been counting them. And by my count, they're up to 17. And some of them are quite large prisoner swaps with hundreds of prisoners on each side. And imagine how difficult it is to arrange for a prisoner swap. Imagine the logistics that have to go into that. Imagine the trust that has to be created to believe that the other side is going to do what they said. And for that to have happened 17 times means that somebody is talking to somebody. And recently, Secretary of Defense Austin said that he had talked, I think it's the second time in eight months, to his counterpart in Russia, because they are afraid of a direct confrontation. But that is not the talks we need to have. The talks we need to have are peace talks. And what would, would peace talks entail? What kind of things would be talked about? Well, where would the borders between Russia and Ukraine be set? How can they be internationally enforced without renewed conflict? Who will guarantee Ukraine's sovereignty as a neutral state? What does Russia have to do to get sanctions lifted? How will Ukraine be compensated and be rebuilt? What kind of accountability can there be for war crimes? There's a lot to talk about between Russia and Ukraine and between the United States and Russia. But unfortunately, we're not seeing that happen. And President Biden, although he almost cavalierly talked about the possibility of nuclear Armageddon when he was at a fundraiser at the home of media mogul James Murdoch, he has not been willing to talk. And when Sergei Lavrov from Russia's foreign minister said, 
that perhaps at the upcoming G20 gathering in Bali, there would be an opportunity for the two of them to talk. The US dismissed that as just posturing. If indeed it's posturing, why not call their bluff and try the talks? I don't know about you, but I feel it is the height of irresponsibility for President Biden not to talk to Putin. I feel it's the height of irresponsibility for our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, who is supposed to be the number one diplomat in the United States, to not be continuously talking to his counterpart in Russia. What do we have to lose by trying those talks? While the Democrats have been chastised for even suggesting negotiations, there are elected officials who have been questioning the US policy. And they are Republicans, and they tend to be right-wing Republicans. When the $40 billion package for Ukraine came up in the House, there was not one member of the Democrats who questioned it, but there were 57 members of the Republican Party that voted against it, and there were 11 senators who voted against it. Now, some of them gave reasons that I find particularly offensive. Like they said, that military should be dedicated to the US-Mexico border to keep out the hordes of immigrants that are destroying our country. Or some of them said that we should be using that money to be replenishing our weapons so that we can fight our real adversary, which is China. The Republicans tend to dislike China, and the Democrats tend to dislike more Russia, but you know they both are pretty much war parties. Uh, and those Republicans are understanding that $40 billion is a lot of money, and there's been even more. There's been over $60 billion that's been allocated. And so when the Republican minority leader, Kevin McCarthy, said, if we retake the House, we will be questioning the blank check to Ukraine, that caused a fury inside Washington because the mainstream of the Republican Party and almost and, and every single Democrat want to see that money go through. And now they're trying to quickly pass a $50 billion, $50 billion is a hell of a lot of money, uh, to Ukraine in the lame duck session after the election before Congress, the new Congress takes power. That will mean that the US has spent over $100 billion so far on this war in Ukraine. And I know $100 billion is hard to understand what that means, but it is way more than the entire budget of the State Department. And it is three times what the United Nations estimates would be needed to eliminate global hunger for three years. It's a lot of money. It's not just extremely right members of Congress who've been questioning this. It's also Donald Trump. Donald Trump has been using the social media and his rallies to rail against the Biden administration. And he's saying things that resonate with a lot of Americans. He is saying that if there is not an agreement that this could lead to World War III and there'll be nothing left of our planet. If he had been president, it wouldn't have happened because he would have talked to Putin. We might laugh, 
But we might also think there might be a kernel of truth to that. And it is a message that is resonating with a lot of his base and beyond his base. There are right-wing commentators in Fox News who are calling for negotiations, like Tucker Carlson, the head of Tesla and now the head of Twitter, Elon Musk, who has over 100 million followers, has been calling for a peace plan. He suggested a deal in which Russia keeps Crimea, Ukraine affirms neutrality from NATO, and the UN oversees referendums in Donbass. I would say that leaving the calls for peace talks to the likes of Donald Trump, Fox News commentators, and extreme right politicians is a very perilous thing. I think we have to move beyond partisan politics and those who want to make political hay from this tragedy and start lifting up the growing chorus of nonpartisan voices who are calling for peace. And that includes academics, diplomats, international leaders. It includes people like former US ambassador to Russia, Jack Matlock, academic Jeffrey Sachs, who you might have heard uh, or, or, or seen talking about this issue with a very sensible policy. Retired chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, Mike McMullen, who says we better get to peace talks very, very soon. US Secretary General Guterres, Pope Francis. We should listen to the leaders of the countries who came before the United Nations in September during the General Assembly. And I listened to every single one of the speeches and picked out 66 of them in which they used their short time to address the world community, 15 minutes, to bring up this issue and basically say, we condemn the Russian invasion, but we cannot afford to take sides in this conflict. We take the side of peace. And there were heads like the head of a small island nation whose country is sinking because of climate chaos, who said, you and the wealthy countries promised us back in 2010 that there would be a global climate fund every year with $100 billion in it, and never once have you fulfilled that promise. And yet, a year has not gone by yet, and you have spent over a billion dollars on this war in Ukraine. Where are our global priorities? We should listen to the US Conference of Mayors, a bipartisan group or a nonpartisan group representing 1,400 cities around this country whose residents are feeling the pain of war-related inflation and unmet needs, like the need for clean drinking water. The mayors recently passed a resolution calling on Biden to maximize diplomatic efforts to reach an immediate ceasefire and negotiate mutual concessions to avoid a wider war. These are very wise words that harken back to 60 years ago during the Cuban Missile Crisis, when the US was facing the possibility of nuclear Armageddon with nuclear weapons 60 miles from our shores. And it is quite remarkable to think that today, October 27th, today, 60 years ago, it was when Nikita Khrushchev made a proposal to John F. Kennedy to try to stop the world from being blown up. And he said, he would remove the Russian missiles if the US promised not to attack Russia and something that was not told to the American people, if the US removed its missiles from Turkey. We were very lucky to have two leaders at that time who understood that the future of the world was in their hands and understood the only way to save it 
was to communicate and to compromise. And a year later, at the commencement address at American University, John F. Kennedy made a profound point that is eerily relevant today. He said, nuclear powers must avert confrontations which bring an adversary to the choice of either a humiliating retreat or nuclear war. Basically, he said, don't push a nuclear power into a corner. And then he added, nuclear powers must avert confrontations of this kind because it would show the bankruptcy of our policies and a collective death wish for the world. Unfortunately, I feel this is where we are today. And we must do everything we can to avoid, to reject a collective death wish. In the end, the future of humanity will not be determined by where the border in Donbass is drawn or whether Crimea re remains in the hands of Russia or Ukraine. The future of humanity, historically, borders are always changing and will undoubtedly continue to change. The future of humanity will be determined by whether we as a species can learn to sell, settle our differences peacefully. The future of humanity will be determined by whether we as a species can shift our resources away from building more and more lethal killing machines that enrich a handful of powerful weapons companies and instead put those resources into addressing the climate crisis that threatens the very survival of our planet. This war, indeed all wars, need to end. Wars represent our collective failure. They represent death, human suffering, senseless destruction, and an immense distraction from the climate challenge facing humanity. We need peace now. And we need to celebrate, not silence, those who have courage in times like these to call for diplomacy. Thank you. Thank you so much for the inspiring talk, especially in just kind of recovering from that last part of, of you really putting a challenge to us of what, what we need to think about in, in relation to some of the, 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 the variety of huge challenges uh, we face and, and yet putting a commitment for peace out in front. So we have about 20 minutes to a half hour. Um, or a little bit less, to uh, have some uh, discussion, some Q&A. We have uh, microphones set up, plus uh, on either aisle, about the back middle. And we also have uh, people with uh, roving microphones who can come to you if, you if it's difficult for you to leave your seat. So um, we'll be happy to, to field questions. Yeah, if you could either come down to the microphone or they can, no, someone way in the back. Oh, okay. You can come down. Please, Kayla. Um, I have kind of a two prong question. First, um, okay, cool. Okay, sorry. Um, two prong question. First, um, how do we put pressure on regimes? If we can't use sanctions, we can't use force. You talk a lot about negotiations, but um, at this point in time, it doesn't seem like Russia is willing to negotiate in terms of territorial integrity and also in terms of you know, ensuring that there's no further human rights violations. And then the second part of that question is, what does peace mean to you? Because you talk a lot about 
peace, which I think all of us want here. It's kind of universal, but what would peace look like in Ukraine if we had negotiations right now? Um, how would those negotiations be put forward? How could we even assure that something like Buka or Izium wouldn't happen again and again? And what does that set the precedent for in the future? Well, I think we could look back at what happened with the Minsk Accords because it gives an idea what happens when negotiations take place, the international community gets involved, you have international monitors who come in. Uh, I think uh, we saw in our research how uh, the greatest number of deaths in the exchange between, uh, uh, it, after the Minsk Accords came um, in the first year and then started to go down. Uh, th what didn't happen is the political part of the agreement. So I think uh, that one of the problems is that when these agreements are made, there's no or not strong enough ne mechanisms to enforce them. Uh, when you talk about what would peace look like, uh, I think it's clear to Zelensky, um, or it certainly was clear when he said at one point that Ukraine was not going to be able to join NATO. Uh, that Ukraine, Ukraine had to be a neutral country. Um, now he's gone back on that and said that he wants fast track into NATO. I think that's a negotiating position uh, because I think it's very clear that peace in Ukraine will have to mean that it is a neutral country with guarantees by very strong countries. Um, that it can retain its sovereignty uh, as a neutral country. Um, I think that the issues of um, the Crimea uh, have been, uh, is an issue that could be set aside uh, for the future, for internationally monitored referenda there. Uh, just like it would be important to have internationally monitored referenda in the Donbass. Um, I feel that these are things that can be negotiated and must be negotiated. My question is, when will that happen? Will it happen six months from now? Will it happen years from now? And that's where I think the pressure comes in on how do we put pressure on uh, our government and how do we uh, in, encourage the international community to put pressure on Putin. Putin gave a talk today, and he had representatives there from countries that he is friendly with, and there are lots of them. Uh, and we need to put pressure on those countries to put pressure on Putin. Um, so I think it's a, a question of the world community uh, getting more and more worried about this becoming a wider conflict, the world community getting more and more um, uh, uh, becoming uh, more and more victimized by this conflict because of the high energy prices we're going to see in Europe, because of the inflation and the world recession we're going to see. And I think as that plays out, um, there will be global pressure on all of the parties involved uh, to get real about what peace means. Do, 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 do. We actually have someone right in the back, and then we'll come to you if you can just wait for one. All right, please. Please go ahead, and then. And well, first of all, thank you for being here, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, I have two questions. The first is, uh, well, in light of what was just discussed, how can we really trust the U.S. and the collective West to lead peace if they are willing to sacrifice so many victims, Ukrainian victims? That's one. My second point is, in the video, it was mentioned that uh, the war was illegal, but it seems as though we live in a world where legality is not clearly the same as morality, and it seems as though some wars seem to disturb our sensibilities just because they're fought in the name of security or backed by the UN, as in the case of Iraq. But others, other wars seem to be seen as, you know, Putin is seen as a despot just because it's Russia and given the long history of um, 
of Russia. So what would you say about that? Do you think there are some wars that are legal in this sense or not? Thank you. Well, I think there is tremendous hypocrisy on the US side of saying we want to live in a rules-based order, but the US wants to live in an order where the US makes the rules. And when you see what the US did in the destruction of Iraq, and you saw the horrific war crimes that were committed with zero accountability, um, a lot of the rest of the world looks at this and says, well, I don't like what's going on in Ukraine, but I don't trust um, the United States, uh, and uh, I don't believe that um, there, are not, they, it, there are not two sides to this. Uh, and that's why so much of the world is saying we don't want to take sides in this fight because they see it as a proxy war between the US and Russia. Um, I don't think you can trust leaders of any powerful countries because they uh, use their power to get more power, whether we're talking about Russia or the United States. Uh, and that's why I think uh, it's so unfortunate that we don't have the kind of world architecture that we need to enforce peace talks, that uh, we don't have peacekeepers uh, that are able to do that on a significant level, that we don't have the big powers part of the International Criminal Court where they can be judged and held accountable. So we still in a, live in a world where unfortunately might, might right, makes right. And when you have two major powers like Russia and the United States both trying to exercise their might, uh, that's when you get uh, not only a dangerous situation, but you realize how uh, vacuous um, all of that peace architecture is and how the rule of law doesn't mean it very much. Okay. Please. Okay, thank you very much for your talk. That was very informative. So my first question is like, why is the US at first funding this war? Because when you look at around the world, there was other conflict that were going on. For example, I will take the case in Ethiopia and different, I know it's different, but like, Funding this kind of war until like going to, like you said, US is trying to fund again another 50 billion. So I'm asking myself, what is there for the US to fund this war at that level? Is there another agenda that is there that they're not like showing to the world? That's my first question. And then the second one is like the role of the media because I believe the media is playing a very important role in shaping like the public opinion. So do you think like the way that you exp like show it, like going back to the 2014 mixed agreement, it looked like the media tried to focus on like Russia invading Ukraine. And I know that that's really bad, but is it the role of the media to put like the conflict in the whole context so that people can know what is going on and they can make their own choice and decide what side to choose? Well, in terms of your first point, why is the US so involved in this? I think we have to understand it in terms of geopolitics. I feel like there's two wars going on. There's an internal war inside Ukraine that Russia got involved in and is the aggressor. And then there is the geopolitical war where the US has been the aggressor. Uh, where NATO has been an aggressor, uh, and where there has been an effort to keep the US hegemony by weakening other major powers, whether that's Russia or China. And so uh, I think that part of the reasoning behind this um, is uh, the, that uh, the US really is setting its sights on China, and this is sort of the vehicle on the road uh, to weaken Russia so that Russia and China uh, will not be major competitors. Um, there's also the issue that there has been many years now of uh, demonizing Russia in the US by the Democratic Party because they are many in the Democratic Party that felt that Trump won the election because of Russian interference instead of looking at the campaign itself of Hillary Clinton. And uh, so I think that has sort of paved the way for anti-Russian sentiment, particularly within uh, the Democratic Party. And then your role of the media feeds right into that. 
because the media um, does not show two sides of the conflict. Uh, the media uh, is, um, sensationalizes a lot of war in general because it means more people will watch TV and that will increase the ratings and increase their, their profits. Uh, I would say we are very ill-served in this country by our media and that it means that people are not given the information they need uh, to have intelligent discussions about things like this war right now. And, um, and our media has also become very partisan. So you see that MSNBC is towards the Democrats and Fox is the Republicans. And you know, so where do you find really objective media? It's very, very difficult to find. I would say maybe the only good thing in that is that young people, as far as I realize, recognize, um, don't get their news from cable <laughs> television. Is that the case? <laughs> and that in social media and alternative kinds of media, there is a lot of place to get more interesting uh, and different sides of this conflict. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? <laughs> Corinna, and then uh, Charles in the back. Thank you, Medea. I uh, First of all, I really want to um, say thank you very much for stressing the importance of negotiation. It's now when we have this amount of suffering in Ukraine, now when we see lives l l losing every day for every inch of the land, it's very important. And none of the war effort should be done without very strong push for negotiation. The question is what negotiation, with whom, and about what. And I think very important, I ideally completely agree with you with every single point which you told about what negotiation should be about. And the first point which you stressed was point about territory. So I really want to ask you the question, uh, first question is who and how negotiation of Ukrainian territory should be done. And my second question is about how we use interpretation of current Ukrainian history in this negotiation. Then you retell story of current Ukraine, you stress um, referendum in Crimea. Stress what? Referendum in Crimea, yeah. but you didn't stress that it was during occupation by Russia. Also, you, you speak about coup in um, Maidan, where thousands of people for weeks were staying, trying to reassure their connection of Ukraine to European liberal values. So uh, you also uh, show that events of 2014 following up was civil war in Ukraine, rather than Russian intervention in Donetsk. So I think that we interpret history this way, it's my little bit shift how we see territorial integrity of Ukraine and negotiation about territory. And again, I'm extremely thankful for you bringing it because this is exactly what I'm doing. I'm so happy to see you here and so happy to promote the idea of peace and end of uh, war. But I'm really interested in about your position, and you also stress the mask proposal. I want to know what your position on it. Thank you. The what proposal? Uh, the uh, mask proposal. Thank you. Oh, mask. <laughs> well, your first point about who gets to make these decisions, um, it's obviously not uh, the US. It's obviously between Russia and Ukraine. and. Uh, I think we do have the example of the Minsk agreements in which international uh, actors came in to be part of it and how we had this huge number of monitors that came in uh, from Europe, 1,300. It's a lot of monitors. Uh, and uh, that I think if that agreement had been followed up with, there would not be this war today. So I think you're, uh, that, that Ukraine and Russia have to figure out where that border is. Um, is that an easy thing to do? Not at all. 
Um, but border disputes are happening all over the world. And they get dealt with. And they get resolved. I think when the US gets involved in it, it gets even more difficult to do. Uh, who um, referenda under occupation are not free and fair referenda. Uh, that's why it was not accepted by the world. Although I have many friends who uh, live in Crimea and say they have always considered themselves Russian and they're happy to be part of Russia, but who knows? You need to have internationally monitored referenda. Uh, you, you're shaking your head. You don't know any people in Crimea who would say that? No, I know. I definitely know, but uh, we could not make decisions based on knowing something. Absolutely, absolutely. That's just my point, is to say that uh, it has to be done in a way that is internationally supervised, internationally monitored, and not done under occupation. I think when uh, we saw the referenda that happened in four provinces, uh, most of the world said that was a sham. You can't do that when there's a soldier standing over you with a gun. Um, so uh, this all has to be negotiated. Elon Musk, I mean, he threw something out. Uh, I think it's great that people throw out their ideas of what they think a peace uh, proposal would look like. And I know he got a lot of pushback and he got a lot of support as well. Uh, and it's good because it created a conversation among millions of people. And that's precisely what we need. I think it's quite strange that it's Elon Musk who did it, but I think you know all kinds of people with lots of following. I know that there is the head of Mexico um, who came out with his own idea of a peace proposal and who he was proposing, which was a combination of the head of Turkey and the head of India and the Pope and the head of the UN. I mean, there are leaders around the world who are putting forth their ideas. Uh, I think what we have to do is create the groundswell of support for these ideas to be heard and to be communicated and a recognition um, that there is not going to be victory in the battlefield. Uh, Charles in the back. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> not a question as much as can you just kind of speak a little bit to this sort of phenomenon about um, the proverbial like MAGA Republican who is uh, all of a sudden infatuated with being some, some like flirting with being pro-Russia in all of this. But when, when we sort of dig into why that's happening, we find like maybe flirtations with authoritarianism or Congresswoman Green talking about Putin being the guardian of Christendom. Um, and, and some other, maybe it's just like owning the Dems, and so anything that Democrats are against, Republicans are now for, et cetera. What, what is going on with this, this MAGA <laughs> phenomenon? Is, is there any reason or rhyme at all, or is it just sort of all, um, you know, uh, bootstrapping whatever the moment entails? I don't know, and I find it extremely scary, and, um, and I think that as we move into a global recession, we're going to find some very, very dangerous changes in politics in many countries, including our own and including in Western Europe, where we already see right-wing forces taken over in places like Sweden and in, in Italy. And um, if the Democrats and the liberals and the progressives, or whatever you want to call them, us, whoever we are, I don't know, uh, <laughs> don't know anymore, um, don't get on the right side of this and other issues, um, it will be used by white right extremists. Uh, and uh, they will say that it's because of this war in Russia that we are paying $6 for gas. It's because of this war in Russia uh, that we can't afford to pay our rent. I mean, we're starting to see that, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to be more. And you know it's going to be quite true in Europe. Yeah. And there are already a lot of protests that we don't hear about in our media, but I get them in my inbox every day. Protests happening in many countries in Europe that are initiated by extreme right groups. And they're connecting the inflation and this issue of Ukraine. And they are pro-Russia. And 
the real, the, the uh, uh, anti-war left in Europe doesn't know how to deal with this. So um, it is creating tremendous fissures and realignments um, that I think uh, are played into in this country, which is why I focus so much in the talk today on why it's so dangerous the Democrats can't come out calling for negotiations, because that's leaving the whole field of peacemaking to right-wing mega folks. And is that where we want to be? I don't think so. We can take one last question. Um, Audrey. Okay. Oh, I didn't see I didn't see her. Um, I want to echo the thanks um, from everyone uh, to, uh, with the emphasis on calling for peace. Obviously, this is the exact place to do it. So thank you for that. Um, I was very curious. Uh, we've heard a lot about politicians, seen a lot of images of soldiers, which makes sense. This is a war. I was wondering. Uh, we haven't heard a lot about the people in Ukraine who are calling for peace, the everyday people in Russia who are calling for peace. And I just wanted to know uh, why those voices weren't in the video or in your remarks tonight. Well, I think when you are in the midst of a war and uh, a lot of media censorship, uh, it's very hard for people to speak out, especially when doing so can be at great risk to their lives. We saw when the war broke out in uh, how Russians came out on the street to protest, and uh, there were about 1,400 of them that were arrested. The protest died down when the, um, Putin said he was calling up 300,000 reservists. There was a new wave of protests. And in that wave of protests, many Russians leaving the country because they don't want to fight. And I think there is. Uh, a growing breakthrough in the media in Russia through alternative sources, people getting VPNs to get beyond censorship. Um, and a, there will be a growing discontent in Russia uh, against the wars. Inside Ukraine, it's also a lot of uh, sense of this, we're fighting for our survival, um, we're fighting for our country. Um, but even within that, there are Ukrainians who have refused to fight. There are conscientious objectors in Ukraine as well. Um, there are people who have fled Ukraine because they don't want to fight. Uh, we at Code Pink are part of an international effort to provide resources and help for conscientious objectors of this war. Um, and I think it is important that we uh, talk about them, and we find ways to support them. I'm sorry uh, that we didn't bring them up in the, in the video. It is, as you know, a very short video. But we have a whole chapter dedicated to that in our book. Uh, and we do um, encourage people to get a copy of the book. And we encourage people to really get involved, because uh, we're at a very difficult, dangerous place right now where there is not the kind of peace movement that there was even at the time of the Iraq war, where hundreds of thousands of people got out on the streets to say no. Um, we weren't able to stop that war. And I think that's part of the reason that people feel discouraged coming out to uh, anti-war protests since then. Uh, but we have to. And I encourage people to get a copy of the book, to read it, to pass it on to friends and relatives. It's a good holiday gift. Uh, <laughs> I also encourage people to, um, to take this video and show it in other places. We have uh, people now who are doing house parties just as a, uh, an opportunity to talk about these issues. And we're also encouraging people to be visible. And that might mean that it's just 10 people going out on a street corner and handing out flyers, or uh, people creating a sign saying, uh, ask me about peace talks in Ukraine. Um, but some ways to get the conversations going. And you are in a university where hopefully you have these conversations on a regular basis. But anything you can do to help us move those conversations to places where they're not happening, uh, and to keep to put more pressure on our elected officials. And this is the last thing I, I want to say, which is uh, that it is so sad that these 
uh, 30 brave souls who signed on to a letter calling for negotiations were so pilloried. Uh, and after the elections will hopefully be a time to renew this call. And so we need people to be calling members of Congress uh, to be saying that um, peace negotiations is actually a good thing, that for us this is not about party politics, this is about ending a very, very dangerous war that could become a nuclear war. And anybody who wants to get involved with us, you can reach us at Code Pink, you can write to info at codepink.org, um, you can also go onto our website and uh, sign up to our, every two weeks we have something called Code Pink Congress where we discuss issues of the day and we take action during the call. And you can also go to a website called peaceinukraine.org uh, and join a coalition effort that includes many groups like Veterans for Peace, World Beyond War, Peace Action, uh, and others. So those are some of the things that I would encourage you to do. Medea, thank you so much for being with us tonight and for sharing your ideas, sharing your film, taking questions. Really, it's been a pleasure to have you. Can we thank Medea Beckham?